you feel happy. So, Mike, welcome to Timelines. Hi, Bill. How are you doing this afternoon? So, we're having fun now, aren't we? Good, good. So, yes. Mike is a silver sponsor. He is also has a fine business in real estate and mortgage for a long time, since 1976. We're here in Reno, and he's also in local government as the um, county assessor. That's right, Bill. Uh, I've been in real estate. I've had a real estate uh, brokerage for uh, 41 years, a mortgage broker for about 38 years. So I've got a good working understanding of uh, real estate, real estate terms, sales, sales prices. And I think it was a natural fit to, uh, to become the assessor. The assessor is looking at uh, real estate values, among other things, part of the business, probably half of the, more than half the, the county budget is based on uh, real property and real property values. In addition to that, after I, I uh, assumed uh, the office of assessor here in town, uh, in the county, I, uh, I was sent through all the classes and uh, now I'm uh, licensed as a personal property appraiser as well. So uh, I can value uh, everything in the casino, everything in hotels, uh, pizza ovens, airplanes, mobile homes, anything that isn't real property is personal property and I, and I know how to value that well, as well. I'm an implant from California. I escaped California, sure. came to Reno, Nevada, which I absolutely love after serving the military. But I'm more familiar with California now. Do you have a tax assessor here also as long as 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 assessor and a tax collector? We have a treasurer. A so, treasurer. So, the, uh, so you're not the tax man. I'm not the tax man. You know, people get a conf get confused. The assessor's office is, is is the simplest way to think of the assessor's office is where the the county's appraiser. We appraise things for the county, and and so the county appraisal office could be uh, synonymous with the county assessor's office. Uh, we don't uh, set the tax rate, we don't collect the taxes, we don't send out the tax billing. The treasurer does all of that, but the assessor, our role is to find the value, find the value of, of raw land, find the value of improved properties, find the value of, of personal property that's used in the businesses. Uh, if you think about it, every single thing in the state is taxable unless it's excluded by law with a carve out <clears throat> and i'm talking if you go to a hotel the beds the the, oh, the, the the dressers the flat screen tvs the towels uh every everything that's in a hotel room everything in a, in a restaurant the tables the chairs the frying pans the ovens the silverware all of that's taxable and that has a value and we establish the value Turn the values over to the treasurer. The treasurer figures out what the taxes are going to be and sends out a, a bill to the. So the treasurer is like the tax man. The yeah. treasurer is the collector of the taxes, taxes and also the billing billing department, for lack of a better word, yeah. sends out the bills to the, the taxpayers. Yeah, in California, I think they, it's called the county tax collector, and I think they have the assessor also. They do the assessment or oversee right, the assessment. Right. Yeah, they I, have uh, assessors that work for them. Right, right. I, I, I'm not real familiar with how, how they how they process the. But it's the, different the, in every state. But you know, the uh, one thing that's common it's a wake up call is when you have a small business. It's a wake up call when you realize that everything you own, all your property, is taxed in some aspect. Sure, it's amazing. Sure, people don't realize that when they, when they buy a new computer for their, their company, they go to a store, they buy it, they pay sales tax, they think they own it, and, and they do, but yet it still has value. So every year for the next several years until it's fully depreciated, they have a value that they pay a, a, a tax right. after sales tax. So it isn't sales tax. So when people start a business, many times they're, they've got some confusion of why am I getting a tax bill on something I already own. Well, you're paying right. tax on, on the current value of that, the depreciated value of that from the time you bought it until the time that we it, assess it. Definitely a wake-up call. Sure. So going on, stepping back, though, you have um, started out in California as a young kid, born there. Correct. You, you, so grew up escaped, in Southern California. You escaped California. Correct. I, I moved. Uh, I, initially, uh, I, I worked for Cobalt Banker as a market analyst, and my territory was the 10 western states, and I would be in a different city every night for, for about three or four years. And I really fell in love with Gardnerville, Nevada. Oh, yes, it is and, a wonderful and, town. And of all the places and all the cities, I, I, I just got tired of the congestion in, in Southern California, and I moved to Gardnerville uh, back in the uh, early 90s. 
and so I consider Gardnerville's really my, my home in this, this state. I, I since moved to, uh, to Reno for a while and now I'm in Washoe Valley, but I, you know, I really got the values of the state of Nevada from, from the old ranchers and the people I met in, in, in Gardnerville. And, and unlike a lot of immigrants into this state, I wanted to check everything I thought at the border of Nevada and California and find out what the locals do. And, and Gardnerville was the best place in the world for that. The best place in it's the a state nice town. for that. It's oh, a nice yeah, town. The people were regular. I mean, I remember the well, first week or two I was there and I, I'd go to a restaurant with them, I'd lock my car and they'd laugh at me and say, we don't do that here. You know, uh, I had stuff in the back of my pickup truck. I oh, don't worry, nobody's going to take anything in. And that's the way it was down there. I think uh, to some extent it might still be a little bit more like that down there. But, uh, you know, it just it was a, a lot smaller uh, county in those days and you truly had to go to town. I mean, the, uh, the people down there don't realize how lucky they are with the with uh, the Walmarts and oh, the yeah. Home Depots and all of that stuff. I mean, when I was in Gardnerville, you know, you had to make a 50 mile, 100 mile round trip to uh, to Reno to, to get those goods and services. 50 miles each way. Yeah, 50 And basically now you've got a Costco yeah. there in uh, yeah, Carson so, City. So you've got Walmart yeah, down in Gardnerville. Yeah, it's a whole different Minden. thing. It's a whole different yeah. uh, thing. But but it was a good learning experience for, for real Nevada. I mean, we, we could just go camping out in the Pine Nut Mountains, and if we thought there was somebody on the next mountain, we'd move. I mean, you know, there was just a feeling of openness and, and let's get out in the country. So that's what was part of uh, the real draw for me to Nevada is the, the independence of the people. And, uh, and that's... Uh, what what uh, year was this? That would have been the early 90s, 93. It's really 94. grown a lot since then, yeah, hasn't yeah, it? Really, it really has. We have amazing growth here. <laughs> Amazing. But it was a great time to come here. But that was a, a good steady growth. I mean, if you saw, so it wasn't like the, the wild real estate market that followed after that. Back in those days, if somebody sold a house for in a neighborhood for $100,000, the next year somebody might sell it for one hundred and two. A year or two later, it might sell for one hundred and four, one hundred and three. I mean, it was, just, it was always a good growth, steady growth, but not, not the dramatic surges that we saw here in the... Uh, the 90s and the, and the 2002s and 3s, where the market just went went to ballistic. So it was a much better time. Right. It's, I mean, it's interesting, but you know, I'm talking yeah. to even the, the commercial stores, all the stores that have come sure, in. Sure, sure. Really, 390, uh, 395, is be, that corridor here has really started to tighten up and become one big grouping, except for... Washoe County, Washoe Valley is sort of still. Washoe Valley is still rural, rural. And, and hopefully we'll keep it that way. But uh, you've got big lots down there. Big parcels. Big lots, and uh, but there's there's a there's growth everywhere in the county. There's unprecedented growth here in the county, and uh, I think that uh, uh, anybody who wants a job in this county can have a job. Absolutely, anyone yes. who wants a job can have one, and anybody who has a job could probably get a better job if they yeah. wanted to move. So. And we're almost like an island still because it's a couple hours over to Sacramento. It's like eight hours of Salt Lake. Sure, sure. And down south, there's really nothing if you go down 395. Sure, sure. Outside. Yeah, you've got a big, big uh, space between, uh, let's say, the the last outpost of of Nevada's Topaz Lake, and then it's kind of, you know, spotty little villages. All the Bishop would be the next bigger town, and that's kind of a small town. My grandfather grew up in Bishop, my mom's side. Very, very nice uh, area there as well. And and then I, and I, I, I think Bishop and... And those uh, cities along the eastern slope of the Sierras have a lot more in common with Nevada than they do with California. I agree, uh, Ma- except for Mammoth. Mammoth Mountain, and it's like L.A., a lot of L.A. Sure, folks sure, up there. Sure, sure. But it's a really interesting area. It's a beautiful area. We've got the mountains and the hills. We can talk about, usually we talk about that at the end, how sure, wonderful sure, it is in sure, Reno sure, and the mountains. I use it all the time. One thing I do see, too, is, I know since your background, I see that we have a lot of BLM land on all sides of us. Mm-hmm. And I see those are like urban growth limits that are going to restrict the growth in the valleys to some extent. That could be so. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point in time that uh, the, the municipalities, the counties, the cities can reach out to BLM and work some type of a, an arrangement where they could acquire some of that land for, for future growth, for mm-hmm. future Future. Uh, does that ever happen though? Does BLM uh, ever give up BLM land? BLM to... does do that. They will trade some land. They'll donate some land. I think Mesquite is a good example of a lot of that uh, federal land that ended up becoming uh, a city, a city of Mesquite, and and of course that, then that land truly goes on the tra- tax rolls, and 
and uh, and pays for itself. Right. That's when they generate more tax revenues when you sure, bring in sure, that. Sure. Sure. Um, for those listening out there, Nevada, I think, is has more federal land than any other state. I think we're not. Maybe Alaska has more, but we're ninety two percent or something like that. You probably know better than I do. Uh, you know, I, I hear different numbers. Uh, I've always heard somewhere. In the high 80s, 88, okay. uh, 88 to 92. I mean, yep. you know, not much of arguing there. But there's, there's this a huge state, a huge state, and uh, and uh, you know, the vast majority uh, pushing 90 percent is is not owned uh, privately. It's it's held by the one form or the uh, another, either forestry or BLM or BIA or. Who knows what other government entities have a? There's some leases out there, there. for oh, there's military gold. land and a lot of uh, Area leases. Area 51. Yeah, yeah. So what, what's the place where the aliens come in? Area 51, Area 51 I believe. Right? Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Area 51 is also a, a classified area. Mm-hmm. So that's good. So going back into California, young, you had a license. How old were you and had your real estate license? I got my real estate license when I was 24. That's pretty young. Yeah, that's a long time, and yeah. you stayed in it. Stayed in it, yes. Because a lot of people, there's a lot of turnover in real estate. People have one or two years and they get out and the experiment's over. Yeah, it's uh, been a good career for me. I, I worked as a sales agent. I managed offices for Cobalt Banker. I was a market analyst for Cobalt Banker. As I said, I traveled the, the, uh, the 11 western states was my territory. Uh, I don't think I, I didn't go to Alaska. So there were really only 10 states that I went to. But I'd go out and, and check the different markets to see if the company was going to buy an existing real estate company, open a real, real estate office, or, or just uh, look at the market growth in any given community. What made you start a brokerage? I started a brokerage. Uh, I had a mortgage. The mortgage company was my, my first business, and then uh, later we added the, the real estate company. Uh, in California, I was a I was a, an agent, and and, a, and then I had a mortgage company that I owned, and then in Nevada, I strictly was mortgage, and then uh, ten years ago, we opened the real estate office, and just wanted to be uh, uh, kind of integrate some services. I noticed a lot of the local brokers were were partnering with mortgage companies and working some type of an arrangement out. Uh, uh, I'm the only broker that I know of in in northern Nevada that truly has its own. Mortgage broker license and mortgage and a real estate license. The other real estate companies here in town that have some type of a financial arrangement with a, another licensee that runs their their mortgage division. Since two thousand eight, a lot has changed, and mm-hmm. uh, a lot has changed. You've seen Absolutely. a lot of change. So you had your license before the two thousand eight changes and had to evolve with them. Correct. Yeah, I've been involved as, in, in Nevada's uh, growth since, uh, like I say, nineteen ninety two, ninety three in that that area with the mortgage side of it. And uh, I was a corporate broker for, uh, in California for, for uh, Gardnerville, excuse me, a Minden company that, that had uh, right. offices across. Uh, Minden Gardnerville are so close to the yep. state line that a lot of the agents have dual licenses for, for both states. There's not much in California down that direction, though. Well, the folks He's that got... they're dealing with would be Markleyville and, you know, some of those really places small. In, in Alpine County. Now, Kirk, Kirkwood and some of those areas. Yeah, up in the lake. Yeah. The lake, you've got sure. a lot of activity. Sure. Because so, it's right so on the state divide. line. State line is another state line area is huge. That, yeah. that they, they work both sides of that. Yeah. So, anyway, we could talk forever, but sure. we're going to finish up the first period, go to a break, yeah. and we'll come back and talk about your life and success principles. Sure. And we'll let you talk a little bit about politics. Sure. And like, why are you doing politics? Very good. Thank you. Hi, this is Bill, and I just want to thank those silver sponsors and all the members of the RMC for helping us sponsor this series of Meet the Voter episodes. Uh, We've done quite a few this year as we wrap up the last two or three. And I want to direct you to the website. If you go to the front of the website and hit membership, it'll bring you to uh, getting the membership this year, which helps support us. And also, I want to thank the silver sponsors. Uh, Congressman Mark Amadate, life member, Wes Duncan, attorney general, re-elect Mike Clark for Washoe County, Nevada State Treasurer Dan Schwartz, Commissioner Jenny Herman, Eddie Lorton, Andrew Cargdale, and many other people who have helped us. These are some of the people running for office or an elected office. And we just want to thank the silver sponsors that helped fund this episode and the other episodes like these. It really gets out the conservative um, ideas and thoughts and uh, makes makes at least people aware of our uh, members and uh, what they're running for. So without further ado, let me show you real fast the membership for 219. If you just hit membership, you will see the new memberships. We have a life membership, a silver membership. Those are the sponsorships that really help 
these uh, videos and then full membership which also gives you a discount at every meeting and the colors associate membership and the student membership again i want to thank you for your support and being part of the rmc break and we're going to go over mike's life and success principles a little bit into his campaign and finally i'm going to ask you a secret questions about where you like to eat around town so you'll okay. like we'll th think about that one okay so here's mike's life and success principles are persistence Stand up for principle and community. So, Mike, what does principle uh, persistence mean to you? Persistence. I think that uh, once you you decide you're going to do something, you should see it all the way through. I uh, I had an uncle that uh, uh, went in for a job interview and didn't think he was going to get it, but he stayed there and and, and uh, he got the job and he ended up becoming a fireman. It was a fire job for become a fireman, and he uh, eventually worked his way up to. Uh, a fire captain, and uh, from a, from a position where he wasn't going to even get the job, to working his way up to to a captain in uh, in uh, uh, Southern California city, and he and he got to that because he stayed there. And and a lot of times in in your life, you sometimes you think ah, I'm going to call it a day and, and leave, and then you think you know you got to just stay staying there will, will get you through. I mean, you don't have to be the life of the party; you just have to be at the party, and and so you stay there and you. And you uh, and and you just persist, and so persistence will get you through a lot. Just staying after it. Now persistence. I know there's a little bit more of that story. Now your uncle was in the Navy. He was in the Navy. So uh, World War II, or, or no? Uh, after after World Korean War II, War. Uh, after yeah. probably after the Korean War, he was uh, from uh, Louisiana. Used to hot humidity. He gets in the Navy, and of course he gets stationed on an icebreaker up in Alaska. So he, he wasn't. He, he says he never wants to go to a cold place again in his life. So anyhow, he, he wanted to. Uh, he heard about a job interview at uh, Southern California for a fire fire department, and uh, and went there. And they said, you know, if you haven't had any, uh, if you don't have a high school, uh, this is you know, this is 60, 70 years ago. If you don't have a high school uh, a diploma, we're, we're not even going to consider you. So he, you should just leave. So he didn't leave. He wanted to talk to somebody. So he stayed there and he explained that. He'd been in the Navy, and he'd been a fireman in the Navy, and he thought he was pretty good at, at the fire suppression skills on a, on a naval ship, and he thought he could apply a lot of that to, uh, to the uh, fire department there. And uh, eventually got the, he did get the job. And, uh, you know, most people would have heard, you know, if you don't have this, you, you might as well just leave, and he didn't. So, you know, and he told that story about how uh, it was a, a life-changing decision to, to stick around and, and, and get... You know, hear no several times. Just don't hear no the first time, and and he stayed and got the job, and uh, you know his whole life his whole life changed because of that. But well, it sounds like he had a good mentor. Sure, sure. My uncle's a good man. Was your mentor? Is he still yeah. alive? Then? Still is alive. Yes. Okay. And he's retired out. He's somewhere retired in, LA. in his early nineties. Oh wow! Enjoying life. I know yeah. the uh, the L A current recently is very good retirement from the firefighters and anywhere in L A. the right. basin. Right. But that's, that's good. 90 years old, good, you've got some good genes there, too. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So stand up for principle is number two. Well, number two is, uh, you know, if, you've, if, you, if you haven't done anything wrong, you should stand up and, and, and make sure that you, you stand up for yourself. You know, if you've done something wrong, apologize, move forward. But if you haven't done anything wrong, you should, you should uh, fight for your principles. Uh, you know, in my particular case, uh, uh, why I ran for, for the assessor's office is, as uh, year in and year out, I thought my property was being overvalued. And, and since I had the real estate and the mortgage background, I understood property values. And, and uh, I, would, I would go to the County Board of Equalization and present my case and, and, and prevail in, in those situations. And I thought, I have the skills to be able to do that. And, and I need to uh, stand up and, and, uh, and, and, and explain to the assessor and the, and the county why I thought their values were wrong. So... Again, if you haven't done anything wrong, you should feel free to talk, and and uh, and, and uh, you'll eventually pr prevail. Very good. And then finally, community. What does community mean well, to you? Community kind of goes hand in hand with with the last part of it. I mean, I felt if the if the if I wasn't being uh, correctly assessed in my mind, and and uh, continued to have this issue with the county, that maybe the rest of the folks in the county weren't being treated uh, fairly either. So. So uh, part of the reason for running is to, to stand up for the taxpayer. I'm probably the only assessor in the history of the county 
who uh, started as a, as a tax protester and ended up winning the election. So I've been on both sides of this issue and, and I truly stand up for the people of the county. It's very important to me to, to make sure that people are treated fairly because I know uh, we have very complicated uh, tax rules and regulations in, in this state. And uh, as the assessor, we ought to be able to look at those, comply with the law and still help the taxpayer and show them the best way that uh, we can help them and, and still comply with the law and help them understand with the Nevada tax uh, laws. If you look at this, this manual that I have here, this is, this is what we use. I mean, how can the public ever really understand all of this? We're, we're the stewards of this information. We should share this. When the people come to us and have questions about their, their uh, values and their assessments, we should talk to them, explain to them, and show them exactly how we're complying with the law and still do it in such a way that we aren't heavy-handed with the public. Well, that's a good segue into um, why you're in politics. And I think you sort of heard it there a little bit. So you got frustrated. Something happened in your, sure. in your real estate career with evaluations, and you got active, and you ran for office, and you beat an incumbent? Correct. That's interesting. How was it beating? How do you ever win your first election being an incumbent? Usually, it's hard to do that. Well, I, I, I did it to with uh, you know some some good uh, some good questions, you know, and I asked the folks uh, a simple. The simple question was, "Are you do you think you're being treated fairly?" And apparently, uh, over fifty thousand people in the county thought that they weren't. So that's kind of uh, you know I, I ran as a pe people's candidate, a populist candidate, and I, I truly am uh, interested in making sure that the that the the public are, are, are well served. Uh, I want people to come to our office and be treated with a kind of a Nordstrom's level of service, where where they're treated properly. They uh, there's no condescension. We don't uh, try and embarrass or humiliate people. We we work well with the people. We've got uh, the folks up at the the Village League have said nothing but good things about me. And this is the group that uh, this is the group that sued the county and sued the assessor's office. And you know three three short years of of working with me, I've, I've got them where they, they think that we're, we're doing a fair job and, uh, and uh, write letters of, of glowing praise. So, you know, many times elected officials try and tell people what they think the people want to hear. I'm more interested in facts and I'm interested in what, what the people who've had a chance to work with me have said. I can tell you all day long what a great guy I am, but you know, don't all politicians do that, guy yeah. or gal? But when the folks that you, that you service, the people that you work with in the community, come back and, and give you good letters of recommendation and tell you you're doing a good job, that's what this job is all about. That's my reward in this job. So how long have you been in the office? I've been in the office uh, a little over three and a half years. It's a four-year term. It's a four-year so term. You're coming for re-election. Re re-election. I just uh, went through the primary. Uh, you my, did well. Uh, you were a great candidate. I uh, saw all your signs. And my, um, you know, it's a process that you need to go through. Uh, my opponent tries to uh, uh, make some issue out of a couple of folks from my office ran, and fair enough. Though, but it wasn't. It wasn't the kind of uh, uh, we're running because we don't think he's doing a good job. They they ran because they wanted to try throw their hat in the ring, and I I don't know. Uh, have any disagreement with those folks. Uh, I, uh, I was friends with them before the election. I was friends with them during the election, and I'm, and I'm friends with them after. I, I don't have any uh, ill feelings towards and, and, those people. And you ran, I, I have a little background in politics, and I'm, I'm an outsider here still, even though I've been five years since I retired from the military. Sure. And you ran a great race. I watched it from the outside. I watched your hustle. You've got great signage. You put them up yourself, don't you? Absolutely. That's put great. I love when myself. a candidate does that. Yeah, Most yeah. candidates have you know, some yahoos, not just yeah. somebody out there sticking signs anywhere, and they're usually in the wrong places. Sure, sure. You know, and I try and, you know, I've had a couple of issues with uh, N, uh, NDOT and, yeah. uh, you know, the city of Reno. You know, I, I didn't intentionally just uh, put up signs on uh, where I shouldn't. But, you know, with my background in real estate, I know how to place a sign. I'm no, you to, do. Yeah, it's that. You got trying that. To, trying to make eye contact and get the best exposure you can. Uh, You're your own marketer. You have yeah. a red sign. It's everywhere. Yeah. And I, it's good. It's just good. It's nice to see those. In fact, I see like some of the statewide candidates taking your locations and sort of like putting up signs now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. I see a little of that where people have uh, kind of follow me around. So that's, that's fair enough. You so know. you definitely have. So I got a couple more questions to go before we ask you about sure. your favorite place to eat. So in in your business now, you've been elected three years. 
Tell me what's the best part of the office. What's your best day? Can I tell you, the, the absolute best is helping people. I mean, we had a situation where a, where a, a, a local person came to me and thought their, thought, thought their land was being overvalued. And we did some research, and, and, and by gosh, they were right. I mean, the, the assessor's office, again, where the, where the appraisal office for the county, we manage about 100, almost 179,000 parcels in this county. It's a huge county. We're not infallible. Uh, there's things out there that need to be drawn to, brought to our attention, and where they are, when they are, we fix them. And just an example, uh, this particular person lives uh, here in the south part of uh, the county, they showed us that, their va that they thought their values were on their land was uh, excessive. They were correct. And then I was able to go back and reduce the values on the surrounding 50 homes so immediately surrounding because if this property is overvalued, that means all of these were. Back when I was uh, out, when I wasn't the assessor, when I got my values reduced, they didn't reduce anybody else's values around, and they should have to equalize that neighborhood. They should have reduced all my neighbor's properties, and they didn't. So I feel that uh, I'm doing things the right way, and I'm doing things that help the public versus trying to figure out how I can trip the public up and use all of these laws to, to gain advantage over them. So what's a bad day? What's a bad experience you've had? Mm -hmm. I can imagine, well, you're in the public eye. Weird things happen. Anything come to mind? I can't really think of a real bad day. We That's deal good. with the lots of issues, and uh, you know, we're just trying to get resolution. It isn't. I don't take it personally. I mean, uh, again, and I asked for another great day. It was a meeting with uh, with one of the richest men in the world. Uh, I think he's number thirty eight or thirty nine on uh, the Forbes list of the richest people in the world. His name is uh, uh, Herb Simon. Herb Simon owns a local mall here. He probably owns, owns a local mall in probably every city in America. I think he owns several thousand shopping malls. He also owns the Reno Aces and uh, the, the baseball field there. So got a chance to sit across the table with him and, and talk about value. <laughs> He's and, a baseball player. Yeah, so I'm a long way from where I started. <laughs> when I get to talk with one of the richest people on the planet yeah. about the value of their baseball park and, and have a great meeting with them. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think we came to a meeting of the minds and, uh, and uh, he started paying his property taxes, and uh, we haven't had any issues. And uh, he's a great <laughs> man, and, uh, and, oh, wow. and I really enjoyed meeting him. That's right. I know a little bit of that background. Sure. When I first got here, I heard about the sure. uh, property tax. Got to sit debate. right across the table with him and, wow. and get a chance to talk with him and uh, explain to him why we thought our values were, were fair. And at the end of the day, we were right. And it wasn't. So that's, is that multi-level negotiation? Yeah, like city, county. We well, had or you know people? numerous uh, entities around the table, but but I mean, it was a situation where you know we had we had a comparable we had a, a not a comparable sale, but we had a comparable ballpark. The the Sacramento uh, ballpark, the River Cats, had recently been in a court situation yeah. where the judge had put a value on that stadium, and we could say the judge in California says the stadium is worth this. And, you're, and take some variables. We have fewer seats here, but we could do some analysis and come up with a kind of a number. I mean, how many? How often do you get a comp of a ballpark? I know. It's luckily, a, it was close here on the West Coast, and, and it, you know we could use it. I'm right? just thinking about that. It's like like real estate. You've got a subdivision. You're pulling comps out of subdivision. Sure. Now you're expanding out to sure, baseball sure, park. Sure. Same thing, but so, a bigger scope. Yeah, right? Absolutely. And 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 we, so we had a court ruling there saying what the value was. So you know. Everybody can have their own opinion, but when a judge says something, his opinion's a little bit more of an opinion than the rest of us. And, and when the judge in California said, this is what we think the, the ballpark is worth, that's a good, good benchmark to use. Uh, that's an interesting story, because when I first got here, I remember hearing about it and sure. people talking about it, because it was really unique. And ballparks are very controversial. I know that within communities sure. and the, the teams and all that. A lot of politics, right? Sure. Yeah. So that's interesting. So very good. So finally, finishing up, this is really important. What do you like to eat in town? If I come to town, if I come to Reno or Gardnerville or someplace in the valley here, or Carson City, where should I go to eat? Well, I'm sure there's a lot that, of places. That might be tough for a lot of folks, but if you wanted to have the best meal in town, you go to my mom's house. <laughs> my mom's going to make the best food. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off because you don't want anybody going to your mom's house. Okay, well, so where else should we go? A couple know, places. There's, there's, what there's, we there's lots of great restaurants. It there depends are. on what you, you, you want to eat. Uh, Reno's kind of 
getting to be a real foodie town. Uh, the, the local newspaper's got a food critic that does a great job reviewing uh, restaurants, uh, get some good, good ideas there. There's a constant change of, uh, of, uh, of uh, restaurants here. There's new restaurants coming in all the time. But, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Restaurants, a lot of people now go out to restaurants. There's a lot of folks do that. And, and most all of the, the, re- the restaurants in town actually are renters. They rent their space. Right, and that's so, true. The so there's a pending uh, possible uh, legislation that'll, uh, that could uh, come in, SJR 14, and it will has the ability to double the property I was going to ask you about the, the legislation that you're, you've been talking about in your campaign. Uh, SJR 14. And so if a property were to sell, the new landlord would have higher taxes. The higher taxes then would be passed on to the restaurant, and then the restaurant would pass on the uh, the taxes in the form of higher meals. So your favorite restaurant either would pass those on or might be out of business. You know, it, it just it's going to be a massive tax increase. And if that happens, you know, uh, it'll it'll affect the whole economy. Nevada is known to be very business friendly. We don't have any state income tax, which is right. wonderful for retirees coming into this area mm-hmm. who s- sell their houses in other states for a lot of money, especially California. Live high in the hog, and our business taxes are fairly low. Mm-hmm. I know we get income off of mining. Where does our income come from for the state mostly? Well, it's property tax, it's mm-hmm. sales tax, it's fees, it's fines, it's uh, lots mining. of different mining. I think mining there's, too. There's, there's, there's a lot of different sources that fund fund government. And we have a smaller government. It's part time. It's tradition. I mean, it's every two years. Thank we're goodness. Stable. Yes, absolutely. So I, I'm not going to let you off though. If if I come to town, where should I eat? If I want to eat steak, where do I go? Oh, God. If I want to eat good breakfast, where do I go? The best, there's several good steakhouses. Yeah. It'll be the Atlantis and the Western Village, and uh, I'd probably uh, go to Western Village. Yeah, Western Village, okay. Western Village, Here yeah, Atlantis. because uh, I really like their uh, their salads. Uh, they've got uh, some really great Caesar salad and a good spinach salad. So, oh, very good. Western uh, Village for a Western steak and salad. Village, and, uh, and, you know, Atlantis is right there. So Where do you go for breakfast? Breakfast, that's, uh, that's going to be, uh, is it Jack's? I think Jack's over in Sparks. Uh, Old, uh, I've never eaten there. Yeah, it's a good, Jack's. good place. So we'll, yeah. we'll leave it at Jack's. There's a Jack. lot of great places here. Yeah, yeah. I can name four or five. But yeah. Jack's in Atlantis, you said? Atlantis, for, Western, in, Village, in Western Village. Those are good places. Atlantis is always known for a lot of their food. Atlantis has uh, yeah. got a great reputation. Uh, Atlantis prides itself on, on good food, and they have good food. and It's a great casino. And, I, and that doesn't mean anybody else is not. I just... Uh, I just know that place. So if someone's coming into town, how can the listener get a hold of you, whether going for real estate or a loan or for your campaign? What's the best? Well, well they, uh, my campaign is, you, is what, I'm, what I'm focused on now, and it's uh, Clark for Assessor. Clark, Clark for Assessor, yeah. It's a very nice web page. It's very good. I know that's your focus, but you still have a business, too, and it's Transaction Realty. Well, well I, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, you know, my opponent in this, uh, this race continues to say that I spend my time at the real estate office. And, and that's simply not true. I'm a full-time uh, assessor. I've, I've got five full-time employees that run the real estate company. They run the mortgage company. These are long-time employees. They run well, the I think the president management. of the United States runs businesses, too. Well, uh, I think had, he, he, yeah, he had. I think business. he's got. I think he owns and, some. And, he's and in so background. My my opponent seems to think that that's a bad. No, thing. it's a good thing. You know, I, I've got a successful business, and uh, you'll find out more about his business uh, uh, knowledge <laughs> know. later. Mike, one last thing, and it's really important. I want to put this in. SDR fourteen will affect this state. I know you've been one of the proponents opposed to it, very vocal, and I haven't heard anybody else as vocal as you are. You know, I, I don't think that the rest of the uh, elected officials truly understand how this uh, SGR 14 will affect the community. You know, as the assessor, as the appraiser for the county, we're the ones who put the uh, uh, the property tax cap on, and we va- figure those values. We also figure out figure the uh, uh, the depreciation, and when we add that back in, it looks it looks like this will be the largest property tax increase in the history of the state. That's not good. Uh, the That's largest good. property tax increase in the history of the state, I can't emphasize that enough, it's also an amendment to the state constitution. When they, when they amend the state constitution, it's, it's tough to change that. So this particular tax is gonna be so large, 
you have no idea. And, and they're trying to sell it in a disingenuous way. They're not giving you percentages. They're not giving you dollar amounts. They're not giving you tax rates. They're just telling you, uh, we're going to get rid of depreciation and the tax cap. I guarantee there isn't one person in a thousand who understands how that'll impact them. The assessor's office understands that. And I was, uh, I was uh, just uh, uh, vilified for trying to share this information with the public. Clark shouldn't be talking about it. He doesn't make policy. He only implements policy. How dare he talk about this? Well, as the assessor, I feel it's my role to inform people of tax ramifications and value ramifications in the future. They need to take a good hard look at this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Most political debates usually have somebody pro and somebody uh, against uh, uh, any particular issue. You pick an issue and you'll find somebody who says likes it, somebody who doesn't. On this particular issue, the, the people that are for it won't say a word about it. They don't want any attention drawn to it. They want to keep the public in the absolute dark and make sure that the people have no idea what this is going to do to them until after the fact. Until after the amended constitution happens, it'll be too late. Sure, you, the folks will get a vote on it. I don't want to be uh, disingenuous. It's already been approved by the uh, legislator in the 2000. Uh, 17 session. If it gets approved again in the 2019 session, it'll go out for a vote. But when it goes out for a vote, it's like all of these other amendments. The wording, the advertising, it's all designed to confuse the public and, 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 get, this, and get this uh, ballot uh, initiative through. But if people understand this, this doesn't have a chance of passing. The people who want this are the people who are going to benefit from it. But the people who own homes, the property owners, they're the one who's going to pay this, this burden, and it won't help them at all. If your property taxes go up 100%, how will your life be better? That's a well, question everyone needs to ask themselves. Well, that's good, Mike. So it's a no on SJR 14. 14 correct. And, and the technical name of that? It's Senate Joint Resolution Number 14. 14. And it'll be on the ballot. It'll be on the ballot. It's coming up. And, uh, Twice, right. It, it should come up... Uh, uh, again, well, if it'll come on the ballot if the uh, the 2019 uh, session in uh, in Carson City uh, approves it again, that's when it'll come up. But uh, it, it's something that the people need to look at. They need to take a good hard look at. I, I will say that yesterday, uh, for the first time in a room that I was in, we had a statewide elected official who who finally spoke out against this. Ron Connect, the state uh, controller said this is not a good idea and uh, you know I'm glad that somebody else is talking about it during the primary session uh, primary season I would seem to be the only person who talk about it many elected officials certainly all the Democrats are, are blatantly for this and can and want you to know that but uh, the Republicans many of the Republicans refuse to speak out against it so it's a bit confusing to me when, when you've got the the largest property tax increase in the state of the his, in the history of the state and nobody wants to really talk about it. Well, I appreciate that. We'll go in more depth a little sure. bit later on sure. that. But sure. I appreciate coming on timelines and sure. meet the voter Very and good. being a silver sponsor with the RMC. Appreciate that too. Great. Great. And good luck with your campaign. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, talking with me. Good. Bill, and thank you for listening to this episode of Timelines. If you could go right here and subscribe on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, and watch a few more movies over here. And if you're listening to on iTunes, go ahead and subscribe. Appreciate it very much, rating and review. Till next time, take care and always make it a great day.